All right, welcome back guys. As promised, I have a fully functional working chicken feeder here. Totally Wi-Fi and remote controlled. If you watched the previous video, we got our chicks. One of them got loose here in the lab. This is my lab partner over here, baby Mia, and she has her chickies and she's really happy about it. You wanna, you wanna name him? What's his name? What's his name? No, he doesn't get a name? Okay, that's cool. We'll name him later when we figure out what he, what, it's actually she. All of our chicks are she's. So we will name her later when we uh, come up with names when they get older. We can wait, we don't have to give them names right now. <laughs> Do you love her? Yeah, she's really cute. Okay, so I'm gonna get into what makes this chicken feeder work. Here, you wanna push the button? You wanna demonstrate? Here. Demonstrate the feeder. Ready? I'll do it for you. See? Chicken feeder works. We're gonna get into what makes this chicken feeder function, what makes it feed the chickens, and how we can do it over Wi-Fi, or we can do it over a remote control right out of the back door of the house. So let me let my lab partner go here for a minute because she's coming after the birdie with a pair of wire cutters, which is not what you're supposed to do. So let me get into the details here. First of all, before I get started, I just wanna do a little recap for anybody who hasn't been following along about what this device does and why I invented it. This is a Wi-Fi chicken feeder that you can control when you're not home. You can be anywhere in the world, connect to this feeder, feed your chickens, make sure that they're getting fed when you're out traveling, when you're away on vacation, when you're away for work. Feeding chickens at home is, uh, raising chickens at home, I should say, has become kind of a really popular thing here in the United States. Uh, I know several people who are doing it now. It's kind of taking off maybe all over the world. People want fresh eggs. They want to know where their food's coming from. But one of the hangups is how do I feed them when I'm out of town? How do I feed them when I'm not there? So this is a great way to do that. This is how I'm solving it. You could do the same thing. I'll have a parts list. I'll have a, a blog post explaining the code. You could literally copy and paste the code and you go do it yourself. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up this video into a couple different parts and I'll put the little time codes down below that you can click on to get to each part. First, we're going to talk about the can, the hopper and the dispenser that we're using. So the hardware that makes the food come out. Um, and then we're going to talk about the electronics that I'm using to make this work, and then we'll get into this software. So for the can, I'm just using a feed container, which I'll talk about that in a minute here. Uh, this is a shaftless uh, screw conveyor. That's the technical term for it. If you were to try and buy such a thing for an industrial purpose, it would cost you probably $200. This is actually a replacement part for a Traeger smoker, and I think I got it for around $35. So it serves the exact same purpose. It's perfect for this application. but. Um, there were a few things I did to this can before I shot this part of the video, so I'm gonna walk you through that right now, and then we'll talk about the dispenser, the motor, how it all goes together, what modifications I had to make to make this work, and then we'll go from there. First thing you need is a bucket, a container of some sort to store the feed. This is actually a feed container. It is a locking lid container to keep rodents out. You know, raccoons will try to get into these containers if they realize there's food inside them. It's 10 gallons, it's plenty of feed for this project. I just took the can, drilled the holes on either side just like I did in my test bucket. If you watched that video, you know what I'm talking about. And these holes are to fit this stainless steel pipe with our corkscrew inside and all the way through the container. Now I'm just going to go over a couple of things that I did here that weren't totally obvious if you uh, didn't go through this process already. The first thing is that I took the stainless steel pipe and I cut it a little bit more than it was cut before so there's more area for the feed to get into the corkscrew, the corkscrew drive here. Now I'm gonna insert this into the holes and I will show you what I did on the other side here. Trying to do this without making too much racket. Okay, so I installed a bracket back here, which is going to just hold the pipe securely so it doesn't wanna rotate. When the pipe is filled with feed and the shaft is rotating, it does wanna spin the pipe. This should prevent that. Um, so this is just a galvanized L bracket with a slotted hole here so you can adjust it if necessary. And I just came through the back of the container here. I'll go over the other holes here in a minute. Uh, we don't actually have to go over that right now because I have to get this thing caulked uh, before we move forward. So I wanted to show you this before I go ahead and caulk it. Once it's caulked, the pipe can't come out. So I just want to show you how it goes together. And then let me go ahead and caulk. I'm going to use a uh, silicone um, caulk here that's totally safe. It won't be a problem for the feed, but it'll keep insects and rodents from getting inside this container. So one of the things I didn't talk about in detail in my last video was um, how to select the proper pipe to put your corkscrew in. So if you don't pick this exact screw conveyor, you're gonna end up with something that's a different diameter. This, I, I literally just went on and searched for a Traeger smoker replacement part. Found this because it's the piece that's inside of a Traeger smoker that moves the wood pellets from the hopper into the hot part of a smoker. 
And what you wanna do is you wanna measure the outer diameter of this shaft and leave a little bit of play there because if it's too tight, it will jam. You'll get feed stuck in there and it will jam it. So here, if you look closely, we're looking at about one and a half inches is probably about right for the internal, or that would be the ID of the, uh, the pipe or the OD of this shaft. So whichever shaft you pick, just make sure you have a little extra room. You can see I'm not getting real tight on there. There's enough room for it to wiggle inside there when it's inside the stainless steel shaft, the stainless steel pipe. The stainless steel pipe is literally just a piece of stainless steel. I just went down to the steel yard. We actually live very close to a steel yard where you can just go and pick out. If it's made out of steel, these guys will have it. They'll even fabricate it for you. But it was just a piece of leftover stainless steel tubing. And the reason I chose to go with stainless steel was because I didn't want to go with PVC or any type of plastic because this thing's gonna be turning in there dispensing food and it could shave off a small amount of plastic into the chicken food and I didn't wanna be feeding my chickens plastic. All right, so the shaft, this right here is the shaftless shaft. It's a shaftless screw conveyor, corkscrew thing. It came with a hole that went straight through the shaft. You can see that there. And what I did was I tapped one side of that hole with a five millimeter tap and then I put a, a five millimeter set screw, which I had in there. And you see the shaft on this motor is a 5 16 shaft, which I'll go over this motor. This is a gear motor that I already had in my lab. It's, it's more expensive than the motor you need for this project. You can use a much cheaper gear motor to dispense the food. You can actually probably buy a Traeger replacement uh, gear motor from a grill, and that would probably solve the problem. Uh, so this is a 5 16 shaft, and by chance, by luck, the, the ID of this shaft on the end of the corkscrew was approximately 5 16 inches. So what I did was I tapped the hole that came with it, but it was a little loose. The screw was a little loose in there. So what I did was tap a second hole, and I'm just gonna put two set screws on there just to play it safe because I don't want this thing to loosen up when I'm out of town and not, uh, not dispense feed. So you'll see all I do is just loosen up my set screw, slide this onto the flat part of the shaft on the motor, and then crank down my set screw and we're good to go. And that works flawlessly. I've already tested this several times. It dispenses the food properly. For the motor, I went with this Iron Horse uh, DC motor. Like I said, I already had this. It doesn't have to be this powerful. Uh, to mount it to the side of the can, if you look at the data sheet, the spec sheet on this motor, and most motor spec sheets will tell you what the screws are that you would need. This uses number 1032 screws. So what a number 1032 screw is, is the size number 10 with 32, 32 threads per inch. That's what that means. So there's also a lot of important information on the nameplate on the motor that tells you how many amps it is, how fast it's going to spin, what the gear ratio is. And then to get this to work, all I did here was connect it to a power supply and figure out which direction it needs to rotate. So in this particular case, if I power it up with the polarity, you know, red to red, black to black, it actually goes the wrong way. So you have to reverse the polarity on this, which is what I've done here. And you can see that's the direction that we would want it to turn to push the feed out. Now with the DC motor, all you do is reverse the polarity and it will go the opposite direction. Another cool thing about DC motors is that if you change the voltage, now this is a 12 volt motor, so I have it running, operating at 12 volts right now, it's 11.5, it's close enough. This is, this is at 12 volts right there. What's cool about it is that if I reduce the voltage, it will just spin slowly. Now in my application, I think that the full speed is fine, so I'm just gonna keep it going at the full rated voltage. The reason I selected a 12 volt motor for this is because the battery pack that I plan on running this with is going to be hooked to a solar panel. And that's a common voltage for a solar panel battery pack because the chicken coop is away from the house and I don't want it to fail if the power is out. I want it to be able to continue to function. Okay, so now let me show you how this mounts to the can and then we'll get into the electronics and how the whole thing works, how it connects to the Wi-Fi. Okay, so I had mentioned that I put two set screws and I wanna show you why I did that. The one, this is the hole that came with the shaft. See how it's a little wider there? However, they drilled it. They drilled it out to be a little wide. So when I made my tapped hole, it was the set screw was loose. So I just added a second one for safety. I'm gonna go ahead, attach the two set screws and mount the motor. So you see for the motor, I actually drilled one of my holes in the wrong place here. The second hole is in the right spot. There's actually four mounting holes on this motor. Two of them are not gonna get used because they'd actually fall right at the lip at the bottom of the, of the barrel and that's fine. Um, I wanted to mount the motor as low as possible because inside here I wanted this shaft, I wanted this tube to sit on the bottom. That way I'm not sitting up high and wasting feed, you know, space for feed. So the motor is kind of just going to hang. That's totally fine. It doesn't have to, uh, it's not like it's super heavy or anything like that. And then this is going to sit up on blocks when it's actually outside in use because you want to have the dispenser up high enough that the feed comes out. I don't know if I showed you this, but the, um, the silicone is nice and dry. 
the brackets on there. No moisture is going to get inside this thing. Once I put the screws in, I'm also going to caulk over those because just a little bit of moisture creeping into here will cause the feed to clump up and if it clumps, it won't go into the dispenser properly. Okay, so the screws are nice and tight on the motor. It's not going anywhere. You can see it's really solid. I've got the shaft spinning just to make sure I don't have any burrs on this end over here. You don't want to put your fingers in there. That will probably chop your finger off. I mean, there's really no stopping it with a motor like this. The only other modification I didn't show you here is on the end. I just have this plastic 45 degree elbow because I don't want the chickens pecking any leftover food that's in here. You can see the shaft is right on the inside there, maybe about a three quarters of an inch in. And I don't, at the end when it stops running, you'll see that there's still food there. There's no flap on here. So I just put this so that the food kind of falls out and we don't have to worry about anybody pecking in there. And uh, I'm just gonna silicone this on when it's all finished. Before I go any farther, I just wanna talk about power supply. Obviously this is not a realistic power supply to have out in a chicken coop. You could, you'd have to protect it. In a small chicken coop in your backyard, you're probably not gonna have a way to protect such a thing. Um, you can use a 12 volt power. If you, once I turn this on, you can see how much current it actually uses. It says it's using, you know, the start current was a little higher. Maybe it's two amps start current. Um, let's see if it's, it should say on the, on the motor what it is. It says uh, full load amps, 2.4. So you wanna have a power supply that can give you 2.4 amps. Alternatively, you could use something like this. This is just a 20 watt uh, solar panel with a solar charge controller connected to a 12 volt battery. Now this little 12 volt battery is gonna give you plenty of current. It's probably gonna last a lot longer than you need, but I, I go with a large battery here because the, you're gonna have those cloudy winter days where it doesn't get any charge or any real re, you know, meaningful charge for a couple of days and you're gonna need to power the Wi-Fi module and the motor. Now the motor only runs for a few seconds each day. Maybe it runs for a full minute on your longest days if you're doing a full feeding. And you just gotta keep in mind that, that Wi-Fi module is gonna need something to hold it over when it's not getting that full charge from the sun. Now right now we're inside a building so we're getting zero charge amps. This is showing that it's moonlight, which means nothing's happening. But this will actually, this, charge, this particular charge controller shows you what your charge current is and what your load current is. So right now our load current is nothing because I don't have anything hooked to this. I just wanted to show you this is a viable option. A 20 watt solar panel based on my calculation is plenty for this project. I'm gonna obviously try it out, see what happens and see if this uh, battery voltage starts to drop on those long, on those shorter days where you have long nights in the winter time. And the only thing I don't like about this particular charge controller is this button right here. You actually have to turn on the output uh, I may end up swapping this out for one that doesn't have that because what I'm concerned with is if the battery does completely die, it's not gonna come back on, on its own unless I manually push the button. So now let's get into the fun part, the electronics that make this whole thing happen, and then we'll get into the software after that. For this project, I'm using one of my favorites, as you guys probably know by now, the Particle Photon. This is a little Arduino module that you connect to the cloud. You basically unbox it, open it up, connect it using your phone, connect it to your Wi-Fi in your house, there's no drivers to install on your computer. You just write your code on their website in their web IDE, push a button, and it downloads it into the Arduino. So you could literally copy and paste the code that I have and put it into yours and it will just work. Um, but you have to have a way to make this talk to the motor. So the Photon is cool because it has a, um, an internal Wi-Fi antenna, an onboard Wi-Fi antenna right here. So um, you really don't have to have an external antenna if you're close enough to your chicken feeder, if your Wi-Fi in your house is close enough. I am going to be using this external antenna that I got from SparkFun. I find that these work the best for this application. Um, that's the Photon. The rest of this is power supply and, wi and, and uh, relay controller. So to power it, you're gonna have a 12 volt supply of some form because you already need 12 volts for your motor. So in my case, I'm gonna have it hooked to a solar panel with a battery pack and the Photon requires five volts. So to handle that, and also to handle the relay portion of this, I'm using the NCD.io2 relay board. Now what's really cool about this company is they make all sorts of boards, and basically you could call them shields, for various platforms, and the Photon is one of those platforms. What's neat about this too is that the Photon fits in here, but you can also swap out the Photon and put the electron and make this a cellular chicken feeder instead of Wi-Fi. So let's say it's way out in the back of your property and you don't have Wi-Fi there or you live in a part of the country where your Wi-Fi is pretty sketchy and you want to have a reliable connection, you can actually hook it up to your favorite cell carrier. Um, in this case, and, and the way that would work is you would just take out the photon, the electron fits in all the way to the back here, and that's that. Now I wanted to have the ability to look out the back door or leave somebody in charge, let's say you have somebody house sitting and you don't want to have to teach them how to use the app or have to install the app and you just want them to be able to push a button and 
feed the chickens, whatever the number of servings is that they need each day in the event that you can't connect. So this is a, a local remote, as I call it. This is just a RF remote, radio frequency remote control that will talk to this board. Now, in order to make that happen, and by the way, the way I'm gonna program this is that it's button one is one serving and button eight is eight servings, depending on how many chickens you have, you'd feed them the appropriate number of servings. Now to do that, you see there's no antenna on this board to receive the signal from this remote. So uh, NCD offers this guy right here. This is a little um, overlay board. So what happens is it plugs in right over top of the photon. Really cool concept. And what that does is it routes each one of the buttons on this remote control to one of the inputs on the photon. And then you just take that input and you decide what to do with it. So if, if the button one input is high, then do some action. And the code that I show you in a few minutes here, we'll see how that works. Now, what's neat about this is it has a reverse polarity SMA antenna. Now, my only gripe about this board is that if I install this, now I've got it installed, and you see my reverse polarity SMA antenna, if I were to put this up against the outside of an enclosure, let's pretend this is the wall of the enclosure, and I put that there, I have my antenna protruding through the enclosure, but I have nowhere to connect my power leads because the power leads connect right here and they would hit the side of the enclosure. So to solve that, I have a handy bin of, of uh, RP, SMA, and SMA connectors here. The one I'm gonna use is this, it's just a little extender. This will allow me to extend past the outside of the enclosure. And you can probably pick these up on, on eBay. I don't know where you get these. Um, I have a bunch of them from various projects over the years. I'm sure if you just search for um, RP SMA extender, you'd find it. I'll see if I can source one and put it in my parts list. And now if I install the antenna, I have plenty of room to get through the outside of the enclosure and my um, power supply can still be wired up. The enclosure is from a company called Polycase. Now, for this application, you really need a waterproof enclosure. Please be careful when you're buying enclosures. If it says it's waterproof or weatherproof, don't always believe it. Sometimes they have these really terrible little gaskets that end up hardening and cracking, and then water gets into your project at the worst time. You're gonna be on a cruise somewhere trying to feed your chickens, and you're not gonna be able to communicate with them. So don't cheap out on your cases. Always go with a good case. Now this is the poly case. Uh, I'll have a part number for you. It comes with these nice stainless steel mounts. Now you can put the mount in any configuration here. You can rotate the mounts so that if you were mounting this on a wall, you can have them sticking out if you want. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to tuck them in like this because if you were doing that, you wouldn't be able to put the screws in. But what I did here was I took rare earth magnets. These are some neodymium magnets. They're very powerful and they're strong enough that I can just clip this on the outside of the bucket without having to make more holes in that bucket because every hole you make in that bucket is a risk of getting moisture in there. So I already had these magnets. I just went down to my local hardware store and bought some really short screws, stainless steel screws, everything here I tried to go stainless or galvanized so that it's weather resistant. And you can see that I just tuck these into the back of the enclosure here. Let's see if I can get a better shot of that. I tuck these into the back of the enclosure so that from the front, you don't actually see the tabs and it fits nicely on the side of the can. So we're just gonna mount it on there when this is all said and done. I like having a hinged enclosure for just about every project that I do that I'll ever need to get access to it if something goes wrong because it is your first piece. It's not something you've made thousands of them and you know all the things that can go wrong. This lets you open it up easily in a quick, you know, in a pinch. You can get in there, hit the reset button if you have to, program it, whatever you have to do. So what I've done here is I have modified this box a little bit. I added two holes to the bottom of it. One's gonna be for the power to come in from our solar panel, and the other one is going to be the wiring for the motor. Now, don't just drill holes and run wires through them. You'll end up with spider nests and everything else that you don't want in your enclosure. If you have your wire just dangling through there, that's what you're gonna get. So these little things are called cable glands for anybody who's not familiar. These are awesome little things that as you tighten them, they seal up around the wire. The hole in there will get smaller and smaller. So when you buy these, just make sure you buy the one that the uh, hole diameter is the appropriate size for your wire. So if you're buying a quarter inch wire, make sure that the one that you have is includes the quarter inch wire range. They also include a little you know, neoprene gasket on here to keep the water out. So just drill some holes and install your cable glands on the bottom of your enclosure. Now, if you're doing something different, maybe you have a controller for your doors on your chicken coop, you'll need more cable glands. I always have them in stock. I'm working on various projects all the time, and believe me, these things come in handy because almost everything that I do is installed in outdoor or worse. I mean, these things will hold up to everything shy of submerging them in the bay. So in this case, I always try to keep all my holes on the bottom of my enclosure, 
but I am gonna end up with one on top for the antenna. So I also made a small hole here. Now remember, this antenna is totally optional. If you're gonna only do this, you know, make a Wi-Fi controller, you don't have to have the remote control. It adds some expense to it. It's not necessary. It's just something that I wanted to have, and I wanted to give you the option. If you wanna add it, you can, but if you don't want it, don't, don't add the remote and don't add the little overlay. Now, another thing to not skimp on when you buy an enclosure is to always get the little uh, back plane, the little uh, board, I don't know what they call it, what the proper term is for it and always have a stock of standoffs. Standoffs are these little brass things, sometimes they're plastic, sometimes they're brass, stainless steel, whatever. And what they do is they allow you to take your board and stand it off of whatever you're mounting it to. So in this case, I'll put these screws in and I'll mount this so there'll be a little gap in there behind the board. And this is like a waffle. It has several holes and find some holes that line up. They usually do. If they don't, you can drill another hole. Okay, so once you've got your board connected to the uh, back plane or whatever they call this thing, and I'll try to get the right terminology when I, when I write up the blog post for that, I always just call them back planes. Once you have it mounted, it will look like this. A couple of standoffs there, keeping it separate from the back, from the plastic back. And then what I tend to do, anytime I have a board that's going into a box, I like to wire up as much as I can while it's out of the box to save myself the trouble because it's always tight when you get inside the box. So what I did was, there's really not a whole lot of wiring to go on here. I just shared the uh, positive terminal from the power supply with the common on relay one, which is the relay that we're gonna be using for this. So this is as wired up as I can get it. I'm gonna mount it in that box, but before I do that, I just wanna quickly talk about how this board works. So this board, the, the relays are not tied to the output pins of the Arduino. A lot of times that's how boards work. The output pin is tied directly to one of the relays, so you, you may be limited by the number of um, outputs that you have on that given Arduino. This board uses I squared C. So the Arduino, the photon, talks to an I squared C chip, which then talks to the relays. Now in this case, it would have actually, I squared C is a protocol that uses two wires, two pins. So if this were a 16 relay board, it would still only require two pins to talk to 16 relays. We're not really saving anything here by using I squared C instead of talking directly to these relays because each relay is one pin and there's two relays, so it's still two pins on the Arduino. But what's cool about this board is it has this expansion port here where I can daisy chain several of these together or I can add sensors or various other I squared C electronics to this. So let's say you wanna measure the temperature in your chicken coop or the humidity or anything or control 20 more relays to automate other parts of it. You could do that by just daisy chaining them and they're all addressable and it still uses the same photon. Now we're gonna try and we're gonna check my work here. We're gonna see how well this worked out with the, um, the holes and the mounting of this. So the way this goes is like that. We're just gonna put this guy in here. And like I said before, the hole on the top is optional. If you don't wanna have the remote controller, that's fine. So I pre-wired the power supply for this demonstration. It might not be possible in your configuration. If you do recreate this project, you may not be able to because your power supply might be hardwired on the other end and you have to go through the cable gland before you wire to the board. But just to demonstrate, make things a little easier, I'm doing it this way. So once you've got your board wired up and connected, this is what it's going to look like. I have my power wire, which this will be my battery for my solar panel, but for now it's coming from my power supply. This goes into the positive and negative terminals on the board itself. From there, I take the uh, positive terminal and I connect a uh, the negative line for the um, motor because I'm reversing the polarity. And then the opposite side I take and put into the relay. The way relays work is that there's a common, a normally open, and a normally closed on a relay. We're gonna connect power to common and we're gonna connect the motor to the normally open side. So what we're doing here is we're, we, we have power, we have our, our um, positive wire always connected on the motor to the ground of the board. And then the negative wire of the motor is engaged when the relay engages. So when the software says turn on, the motor will turn on in reverse uh, polarity. So it will come on, but it will be turning backwards. And that's what we want. Um, so in most applications, that's what you want. The way that works is common means it's the common part of the relay. It's always connected to power. And normally open means it only it's open until the relay engages. When the relay engages, power will flow. So now we're gonna go ahead and add feed to the bucket. We're gonna give this thing a try. Um, I also connected the antenna here. As you can see, I just screwed it on there. Be careful with that. I'm gonna add some kind of caulk on there because that is the top of the board, the top of the box. If any rainwater gets in there, it will destroy this thing in a heartbeat. So let's get some feed, fill this baby up. And there goes the dust again. My lab is going to need to be vacuumed and dusted after this project. 
it does make a big mess and this is kind of a nice clean room. At least it used to be. All right, so let's go ahead and test it with the remote. All right. It's working, the feed's flowing out nicely. It's gonna dispense what I'm calling one serving. Obviously that's too small for a serving, we'll just change the software. Right now, one serving is equal to three seconds of runtime. I'm gonna add a scale, I'll measure it, and then I'll know exactly what the runtime is for my feed. If you go to cre recreate this, you're gonna to wanna to measure your feed and make sure you dispense one serving when the one button is pressed. As far as the enclosure goes, it's really simple. We're just gonna close it up, we're gonna take it, and we're gonna stick it to the side of our metal can just like that. And now we have a Wi-Fi, or well, we've only tested the remote control, but we have a Wi-Fi and remote controllable feed container that will dispense food. So let's talk about apps for a second here. There are two ways to go about this. One way is to download software into the Photon that serves up a web page, and then all you have to do is open up a web page in your browser on your phone, which would be served by the Photon itself. The plus to doing it this way, there's positives and negatives to both of these methods. The positive of doing it this way is that you can cut and paste the code and be up and running in just a few seconds by changing the IP address to match your network and boom, you're online. Another positive is that this will work when your internet is out. So if your internet goes down, you can still be at home and control your feeder from your local Wi-Fi. It doesn't require a cloud connection. So if the, you know, if the internet's down or the cloud is down, your feeder's still gonna function properly from within your LAN, your local area network. The problem with this is that you'll have to forward a port from your router, from the outside world, into your router. Your router IP address might change and then you'll lose connection. Uh, it's also very insecure because hackers can get to it. Botnets, they exist. They will take you down. They will, they will bombard this thing with so many requests that it won't be able to respond when it's actually you trying to feed your chickens. So that's not really a viable real-world solution. The second way to do this is to use a cloud-based service. I'll talk about that in a second. I will note that if you did this the first way, you get a really cool feature where it kind of looks like an app. You can save it to your home screen. It'll have a little icon, whatever icon you choose. You can tap on it, it opens up, and it's a, it looks like a standalone app for feeding your chickens. The next method, which is using a cloud-based service, is my preferred method, and I certainly recommend that if you do something like this, this is how you do it. I'm using Blink for this, and I'm gonna show you that method right now. So the way Blink, operates is it's a it's a third-party app that ties into all different platforms and for, for this particular platform we're using Photon so the Blink Cloud communicates with your Photon and all you really have to do is co copy a couple lines of code into the app on your Photon into your into your script or the, the code on your Photon and the, that will link you up to your Blink account and you'll get something that looks like this what's really cool about this is I just dragged and dropped the buttons on here for the number of servings I want and I can actually hop off my Wi-Fi right now I'm gonna get off Wi-Fi the photons connected to the blink cloud my phone is connected to the blink cloud we're on LTE I'm not even on the Wi-Fi right now and if I want to dispense one serving of food I just hit feed one and it will dispense a serving of food over the cloud just like that instantaneously securely What's nice about this is it's very secure because it's connected to a cloud where the Photon didn't punch a hole in the firewall for this to work. We didn't have to do anything like that to expose our network. So this is the method that I would certainly recommend if you're going to go this route. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing that any of this will work because the day that I'm making this, you know, this is how the software looks and works. It may not even exist tomorrow, but there are lots of ways to do this. Um, this is just sort of my recommended way is to go with Blink because you can pretty quickly get this up and running. I can actually give you the QR code. I'll put it up on my website where you can just scan the QR code and it will automatically create the same Blink app for you, the same application within the Blink app for this project. So you don't even have to do all the dragging and dropping and linking up, it will just work. Um, let me go into the software here. I'm gonna walk you through how the Photon software goes into a Photon. We'll talk about that through the web IDE from Particle and then um, I'll just walk you through all the steps. So if you're not familiar, if you're very familiar with some of this stuff, it's gonna be a little bit redundant, but if you've never done it before, this should be an interesting uh, ride for you. Let's start with the software that's going to be on your mobile device. So the software on your mobile device is an app called Blink, and that is B-L-Y-N-K. Uh, it's available for all different platforms. So if you have an iPhone, Android, you should be able to find this for pretty much any platform that you would want to use this for. This is it right here in the App Store on iOS. It's just the Blink IoT for Arduino. It works with all types of platforms. So it uh, works very well with the particle photon and the electron. So here it is. We're going to open that up. If you've ever used this before, this is a very familiar look, very familiar layout here. And what's what I have here are um, eight buttons that I've added to this display, a terminal, 
And ignore the time input. That's a little something I'm going to add later on for creating scheduling so that the chickens are fed on a schedule. Uh, just to give you an idea, you can really expand this however you'd like. So if we take a look behind button 1, you'll see that I've tied button 1 to V1, and I'll explain that in a minute, and I named it 1 serving. Um, and these are just the labels down here at the bottom that describe what um, the labels on the button will be. In this case, we want it to always be feed 1. We could have it on and off, depending on what we're doing with this app. And you'll see if I tap on button 2, it's tied to output V2. So each button is tied to the corresponding V, or the input that we're going to communicate with this app from the Photon. Now if we tap on the terminal down here, I've tied this to V0. And I'll explain all that in a moment here. I added the terminal just so that you can get a little bit of feedback when the device boots. I'm actually going to just reboot it here so you can see. This is just to give you a little bit of feedback when something happens. So what I do is I send a... Actually, before anything will work here, we have to hit the play button in the app. Let me reboot that again so you can see this. If I reboot the Photon, there's a clear screen command that will come through and it'll tell us that the Photon has rebooted. And here we go. That was that. If I dispense one serving, it will let us know that one serving was dispensed. So every time a serving is dispensed by the system, it notifies us of that happening. Now there's actually a, uh, you can't see it right now, but I'm using a different power supply and the power supply dipped. So you can actually see it rebooted the photon at the end of this because the, or it may have even been at the beginning, the photon browned out. Now that's not going to happen in my real scenario because I'm gonna have it hooked up to a battery. If you wanna set up your system exactly the same way that mine is set up, download the Blink app, Go onto my website and on, on the blog post for this video and you will see a QR code. Scan that QR code and you'll have the exact same Blink app that I have and you'll, you'll get an auth code emailed to you from Blink when you do that. You're going to need that auth code in a moment here. Next we're going to head over to particle.io and we're going to program our Photon. So if you've never done this before, um, I'm going to walk you through it a little bit here, but if you've used Photons before then this is pretty straightforward. To program a Photon, the first thing you have to do is take it out of the box and get it um, adopted into your account. There's instructions on the box for how to do that. It's very simple. Once you've adopted it, you're just going to go into the Web IDE and select that device. So I have quite a few devices here. The one that we're using today is Joe P6. So if you just click on it, you have a little uh, yellow star. That's the one that we're going to be working with. The breathing cyan here lets you know that it's online. Uh, be careful because sometimes they get stuck and they show you they're online when they're not actually online. I've had that happen. A lot of these are actually not online right now, but they're showing that they are. So just be aware of that. And then we're going to go ahead and you can copy and paste my code from my blog. I just named mine Chicken Feeder Zero Blink, so it's version zero of this. And here we have it. This is the code. I'm just going to quickly scroll through so you can take a look. There's really not a lot to it. Most of it's just redundant button press stuff that we're doing here. Um, so let's walk through the code. The very first thing I'm doing here is I'm including the Blink library and I'm including the NCD2 relay library. You're actually going to need to delete these two lines out of here, the, both of these includes, and re-include them through the libraries by searching for those names and hitting include into this app. If you, if you do that, if, if you don't delete the lines, you're going to end up with them in there twice and you'll fail when you go to compile. Okay, so here we're going to just define a few things that the Blink library requires. We we're defining this um, Blink print. And then we're going to tell the application that we have a terminal that is tied to V0. And you'll notice that's the same output that I tied in my iPhone app so that we can communicate between here and the iPhone app. We're also, as I mentioned, we're including the NCD2 relay library so that we can talk to the relay board. The relay board is I squared C, so it's not as simple as just controlling the outputs from the Arduino. And we're just going to initialize the NCD2 relay controller. Now, what these are here are for the remote control that I was explaining, the little radio, the RF remote control. If you're not using it, you can ignore these lines, but these are the actual pins on the photon that are tied to each button on the remote. So button one on the remote ties to A0 on the photon. Button two is A1 and so forth down this list. I'm also going to create some variables here to con that, that will contain the state of the blink button. So these are variables that will hold information about the blink button within the blink app that we developed. The way I'm handling the timing for the relays is a little bit tricky. I'm not using delays because if you use a delay, you end up um, blocking the rest of the code that's running on an Arduino. So to handle that, what I'm using here is the millis counter. The millis counter will continuously run inside of an Arduino from the moment it boots up to the moment it's not running anymore. And it will be a number that just continuously goes up until it gets to the top and then it starts over. But for the purposes here, just imagine that millis continuously goes up and will always be higher than it was a moment ago. What I'm doing here is um, 
I'll explain this when I get down to the function that handles uh, disabling the relay when it's time to shut the relay off. But what I'm doing here is I'm just creating some variables. This is relay duration, so this is how long the relay will stay closed, and that will depend on how many servings we're sending out to the chickens and the time at which the relay closed. So if we know the time the relay closed and we need to stay closed for 3,000 milliseconds, then we know we have to open 3,000 milliseconds after the, so it would be if relay duration is 3,000 seconds, then we open the relay at relay start time plus 3,000 milliseconds. So what we're doing here is we're defining that the blink v1 output is going to be stored in a local variable called blink1 button. And these will tie in with what I just showed you in the Blink app. So that V1 is tied to Blink1 button, which is our variable that we created up here. By default, it starts out at zero, but as soon as this runs, it will then um, continuously update and match what you do in the app. And that's what I'm doing here, want buttons one through eight. That's very simple. Then in our setup code here, what we're doing is we're just starting up Blink. Uh, we're gonna clear the terminal in the Blink app on your phone, so it's not showing any old data. When you reboot the chicken feeder, I have it just clear the screen. And then I do a little fancy thing here where I say that the chicken feeder is booting. Maybe you want to add a reset button in Blink one day, you can do that, so you can actually see it reboot. And then Terminal Flush just sends all the data to the terminal. Make sure that it gets out to the app. And then over here, we have the inputs for the remote controls. We're just configuring those all as inputs with a pull-up. If you're not using the remote, just ignore this. Now, this is for the uh, relay controller. This, this is for the ncd.io board. We're just telling it that this is the address where our relays exist. It's the start address. Um, and that's just what you're going to do if you didn't change any of the jumpers on that board. Now we're going to delay 3,000 milliseconds, and then we're going to print the word done right here. And the reason I do that is just for aesthetics, just so it says it's booting, and then you know a third of a second later, it says it's done booting. Now in our loop, and this is what's going to run continuously on the Arduino, on the Photon, uh, we're going to run anything that Blink needs to have run. And now we're gonna just listen for some button presses on our remote control. So if we're reading that the button pin one is high, then feed the chickens one serving. That's gonna call a function called feed chickens, and it's gonna tell it that we want one serving. Same for button two, except it's two servings and so forth. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing, but we're gonna to listen to the Blink button inputs and if we have a one on blink button number one, if it's high, then feed the chickens one serving and so forth. The same thing here. Now, every time loop runs and loop will continuously run as the photon is, is powered up and alive, we're gonna check to see if the relay duration has expired. And I'm gonna explain what that means, but first we really kind of have to understand what the feed chickens function does so that we can understand why we're doing this here. If we were just to say, feed the chickens for 3,000 milliseconds and delay, that would block all code on the photon. We don't want to do that because it wouldn't check in with Blink, it would seize the photon. So instead, what we do is we set a flag when we feed the chickens and we let the flag know when did we close the relay and how long are we going to keep it closed. But we're not going to delay the code. Instead, what we're going to do is every loop, we're going to check to see if the time has elapsed. So if it was 3,000 seconds that we wanted to stay closed, are we three, I'm sorry, 3,000 milliseconds that we wanted to stay closed? Are we 3,000 milliseconds later in time? If we are, then turn the relay off. So let's look at the, the feed chickens function and then we'll come back to this. So every time a button is pressed, we are triggering the feed chickens function with a number of servings that we wanna feed them. For my example, I'm saying that a serving is equal to 3,000 3, milliseconds or three seconds of motor spin time. So if that's true, then what we wanna do is we pass the servings into our function. Then we turn on relay one on our board, which is the relay that the motor is tied to. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna set relay duration, which is a global variable here. And we're gonna set that to the servings times 3000, which is three seconds. So 3000 milliseconds times one would be three seconds times two would be six seconds and so forth. And now what we're going to do is we're gonna set, we're gonna set the relay start time variable to the current time. And what this is going to do is it's going to say we started at uh, when millis was equal to 1 million. And now when millis is equal to 1 million and 3,000, turn off the relay. And that's what's happening up here. If you subtract the start time from the current time that it is now at any time that the loop runs, and that is greater than the duration for the amount of time that we we're supposed to keep that relay closed, then turn that relay off because it's time to open it back up and shut the motor off. 
It's a little confusing if you've never done this, but this is how I do all my watchdogs. This is how I handle a lot of things in, in photons and in Arduinos so that we can have multiple processes running simultaneously without having to use delays. And then the last thing I'm doing here is I'm just dis displaying on the uh, terminal in Blink that we are dispensing the number of servings that we're dispensing. And this is how you concatenate strings. So we're just saying dispensing the number of servings and whatever you have here will end up where you have the percent %d. So then we're going to flush, which is going to send that out to the terminal. And then I have a small delay in here, which may not even be necessary, but I put it in there just for safety. That's all I've got for this tutorial. Um, like I said, there's so many ways you can go about this. You can do it in so many different ways. You can go solar, you can plug it into the wall, you can make the software do whatever you want. Whatever, It doesn't have to be a number of servings. It can do, you can write it to do whatever you want. You can have it so it's tied to a calendar and that it checks in with a, uh, with a server all the time, which is a whole other method I didn't even discuss here, which is really another really ideal way to do this is to have your own server set up and have the Photon check in with your server and you can set calendars, you can make it do whatever you want. Write it in PHP, have it check in with a database, have it log every time it was fed, every time the chickens were fed. Have it send you a text every time that the feeder runs. So if you have somebody house sitting, you can get a text that, letting you know that they push the button on the remote so you don't have to do it remotely from, from uh, your connection. Uh, there's just so many things you can do with it. I'm sure I'm going to expand on this. I'm actually going to try to automate things like the doors so that when the chickens come home at night, um, it will shut the doors to keep foxes out. That's a really cool project. I'll probably post that here. I've even considered using little RFID bands on their ankles. So that's getting a little bit extreme, but we can talk about it. It's doable. They'd be passive, no batteries, you know, just a little strap that goes on the ankle and then on some kind of a passive reader, similar to when you walk out of a store without paying, the things that beep at the door, except that this would be able to count the number of ankles that returned and be able to say for sure, everybody's home tonight so we can shut the door. So we can talk about all those, they're really cool concepts. I'm not sure how practical they are, but they're definitely cool ways to go. So make sure you guys hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and leave in, your, in the comments below any questions at all. I'm here to answer them, that's why I'm doing these videos. I'm kind of just putting this out there. I feel like we're at the point where people are really into the DIY electronics and they're also into the DIY home farming. So this might be something that a lot of people are interested in. So if you like it, subscribe. And like I said, comment, I'm here. I'll answer your questions. You see, I do that a lot. You'll see down below that I've been uh, answering a lot of questions on other videos. And um, check out the post if you wanna go ahead and do it. If you have any questions, you can, uh, comments here are probably easier for me to get to rather than underneath the blog post. So I'll see you guys in the next one.